Hello, and welcome to week 10 of our Faith Foundations course. Today we're studying the Lord's Supper. But first, a review. Last week, we talked about baptism. Baptism is a sacrament, and a sacrament has four parts. A sacrament offers forgiveness of sins. It was instituted or started by Jesus. A sacrament is connecting God's word to earthly elements. Remember, in baptism, the earthly element is water. Today we're studying another sacrament, the second sacrament, that is the Lord's Supper. In the Lord's Supper, God's word is connected to the earthly elements of bread and wine. Jesus says that when we receive the Lord's Supper, we receive bread and wine and body and blood. He says, take and eat. This, this bread, is my body. And this cup is, a new is the New Testament in my blood. That is, there's both bread and body present, and both wine and blood present. This teaching that both bread and wine and body and blood are present in the Lord's Supper is called the real presence. Jesus' body and blood are truly present in the sacrament, but they are present in a sacramental way. That is, if I were going to take one of the wafers for the Lord's Supper and put it under a microscope, I would not expect to find Jesus' cells in there. Jesus promises that his body and blood are really present, but he did, does not tell us in what way they are present. They are present in a sacramental or in a miraculous way. Jesus does a miracle by fulfilling his promise that his body and blood are in fact present in this sacrament. A sacrament is not only a sacrament when God's word is connected to the earthly elements, but also when the sacrament is observed according to the command that Jesus gave. So if the bread and wine are not consumed, there is no Lord's Supper. Remember Jesus said, take and eat. So if you don't take and eat the bread, then it's not the Lord's Supper, and therefore Jesus' body is not present. So this solves all, ki all kinds of problems, like what if I spill the wine? Did I spill Jesus' blood on the altar? No. If the wine was not consumed, then it's not the Lord's Supper, and that's not Jesus' blood. God offers blessings through the sacrament. That's why Jesus instituted this sacrament, is for our blessing. He's, he says very specifically, that in the Lord's Supper, he gives forgiveness of sins. The, uh, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Now maybe you'll say, Vicar, wait a minute, I thought I got forgiveness of sins because Jesus died on the cross and rose again. That's how he forgives my sins. And you would be absolutely correct. That is how Jesus forgives my sins. The, the church word for, for how the sacraments play a role in me and forgiveness of sins is, is means of grace. But this is the picture. It says if God has a, a whole uh, a water tower of, of forgiveness of sins up in heaven and, and he loves us and he wants to get that to us, so we'll call that grace. God's attitude of love towards us, which loves to forgive our sins. But that has to get to my heart somehow. How do I know about the forgiveness of sins won for me in Jesus? And God reveals that forgiveness of sins through human language, through the gospel. That is the message that Jesus forgives our sins and that God loves us. He died and rose to take away my sins. That's the gospel. And the gospel comes to us in two ways. The bare word, uh, think reading the Bible, listening to a sermon, uh, listening to a devotion, or in the sacraments, that is, where the word is connected to an earthly element. And so this is the role that communion plays. Communion forgives my sins in that it connects the forgiveness already won for me by Jesus. It connects that forgiveness to me. Uh, in communion, I am assured that this forgiveness is true and this forgiveness is for me. Now, because that's what, forgive, what communion does, communion connects me to the forgiveness already won for me, that strengthens my faith. When I hear again that Jesus forgives me, that Jesus loves me, and that in him I have an eternity in heaven waiting for me, that strengthens my faith in those promises. It also affects the way that I live. And so in the Lord's Supper, I receive strength to live a holy life. The Lord's Supper is also an opportunity for me. The Lord's Supper is an opportunity for me, first of all, to proclaim in a public way that I believe that Jesus died and rose for me. Uh, and so every time I 
participate in the Lord's Supper, that's a public profession that Jesus did die and he offers me the body and blood he gave for me in this sacrament. The Lord's Supper is also an opportunity to publicly proclaim unity, not only with God, the unity that I have in him because of the right relationship, uh, because of Jesus' forgiving work on the cross, but also an opportunity to profess unity an opportunity to profess unity with the other Christians that I'm uh, celebrating the sacrament with. More on that in a moment. The blessings that we receive in the Lord's Supper are made personal through the sacrament. That is, as, sure, as much as I can be sure that it is really me who is doing the eating and drinking, I can be just as certain then that the blessings Jesus offers are mine, because Jesus says, uh, that this cup is for the forgiveness of sins. So I who drink it then receive that blessing in a very personal way. Because Jesus offers these fantastic blessings in a very personal way, of course I would want to receive them often. And so I'm encouraged in the Bible to receive the Lord's Supper often. Now the Lord's Supper is not for everyone, and the Bible makes that clear also. Paul says, who, uh, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So someone who is not able to examine themselves should not take the Lord's Supper. This might include a, a young child or perhaps someone who is not yet an adult who has not been fully instructed in what the Christian faith is. Uh, such a person would not be able to examine themselves because they, haven't, they don't have the religious instruction to be able to do so. The Lord's Supper is also restricted to Christians who are in unity, because the Lord's Supper is an expression of unity not only with God, but also with those who participate in the sacrament alongside me. If there's someone who does not believe the same thing as me, we should not commune together. We should not receive the Lord's Supper together, because that would be proclaiming that we are in unity when in fact we are not. That would be a public lie. This teaching that only Christians who believe and confess the same thing should receive the Lord's Supper together. That teaching is called closed communion or close communion. Now, what about someone with weak faith? Should someone who has doubts or struggles receive the Lord's Supper? Or is the Lord's Supper only for quote unquote good Christians? And the answer is very clear here also. Someone with weak faith absolutely should receive the Lord's Supper. That's maybe the most important person who could receive the Lord's Supper, because in the Lord's Supper, I'm assured that Jesus' forgiveness is for me, exactly the message that someone with weak faith needs to hear, um, that this gospel message is for me. I look forward to discussing these matters with you in greater detail, either on Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. or on Thursday evening at 7 p.m. God bless you until then.